Um, okay, it's recording. So, um, okay, so welcome everyone. Thank you uh, for joining us. My name is Daniela Grandon and I'll be your host today. Uh, it is a pleasure to present the first speaker of our cosmology seminars this year. Today we have Professor John Peacock from the University of Edinburgh and he's presenting tomographic lensing of the cosmic microwave background. John holds a PhD from Cavendish Laboratory at the University of Cambridge. He is a fellow of the Royal Society and Royal Society of Edinburgh. In 2014, John was awarded with the Show Prize for Astronomy and his research interests are in theoretical observational cosmology, which includes large-scale structure, galaxy formation and evolution and gravitational lensing. Also, as many of you know, he's the author of the famous textbook, Cosmological Physics. So thank you very much, John, for accepting our invitation and you're free to start. Ah, but sorry, I forget to make you co-host. <laughs> Okay, yeah. So maybe you can share your screen now. Let's see if sharing screen works. Okay, how's that, all visible? Yeah, cool. All right, well, and I, I hope you hear me okay. Um, if anybody has any questions, then please shout out. Or if you're if too shy, I guess you can put your hand up and, and Daniela will, will shout on your behalf. Um, but it, it would be nice if this could be a, a bit interactive. Okay, so... Uh, I just need to move the uh, speaker window away. So, so what I want to talk about is uh, some recent work to do with studying the, the large scale structure in the universe and how it gives us some potentially interesting knowledge about the, the global parameters, particularly the matter density, the Hubble constant, um, which as many of you know, particularly the value of the Hubble constant is a, an issue where there's been quite a bit of controversy recently. So in the end, I'm, I'm, I'm going to give you my, my take on, on where we are with that, with that um, Hubble constant tension. All right, so we have a great model, the Lambda CDM model, which gives us a, a detailed apparatus for trying to understand how structure in the universe were uh, developed. And it seems to work extremely well. So, uh, by the way, um, when, when I move my cursor, do you actually see a, a moving arrow? It may help to build a yeah, point. Yeah, we can. Okay, good. It's funny, sometimes in Zoom that doesn't appear. Um, so we have these wonderful observations of the, of the fluctuations of the microwave background and um, yes, these have been around for, for long enough now that a lot of people just take them for granted, but I've been in the field since before we, we ever saw any fluctuations in the CMB and really we should pause for a second and think how lucky we are to be the first generation in human history to see the seeds of all the structure in the universe. So at rate shift 1100 or so, these tiny metric fluctuations developed through gravitational instability into the, the right-hand panel, which is the, the large-scale structure in the galaxy distribution that we map with redshift surveys. And basically the character of these two patterns connects with each other in, in the way that the Lambda CDM model predicts very accurately. So, but things aren't quite as simple as the, as the basic story because the, the picture on the left, although it's predominantly showing us fluctuations in the microwave temperature that existed at the surface of last scattering, so Richard of 1100. But of course those photons, they've got to pass to us and therefore they're going to pass through all this yellow stuff, all the, the superclusters and the voids in the galaxy distribution. And what that means is that there are secondary anisotropies imprinted on the radiation. Um, and that, that, that's a good thing. It tells us some information about all the, the cosmological structure that existed between Richard 1100 and the present. 
So these temperature effects, there's, there's a number of distinct ones. So let me summarize briefly what they are. Um, some I'll say more about than others. There's the integrated sachs wolf effect. That's the simplest because that just corresponds to the fact that photons are traveling through a, a gravitational potential field that's evolving with time. And so there's a simple equation for the, the fractional perturbation to, to the photon energies. Um, it's just the line integral of the, the time derivative of, of the gravitational potential over c squared with a, with a factor two as, as often in, in many GR things. Um, and you can think of this in, in a way as uh, imagine a, a cluster of galaxies or a supercluster, something where a potential well is deepening with time, photons gain energy falling in. Um, if the potential was static, they would lose that same energy coming out. There'd be no temperature perturbation. But because the potential well continues to deepen while the photons are passing through, they, uh, they, they, they lose more energy going out than they gain coming in. So there's a, a net imprint of, of that structure on the, on the, the temperature field itself um, as the, the photons go through, the CMB photons go through. The next um, effect, which I'll just mention for completeness, but I'm, I'm not going to say anything about, uh, relates to, to Comptonization. So that is, um, I know most material in the universe, uh, the baryons are ionized. Um, so those the electrons in the plasma can Compton scatter. And that modulates the, um, the, the, the microwave, the, the energy of the microwave photons that pick up inverse Compton frequency mod modifications from the motions of the electron, which can be either just because the gas is hot or because the, uh, the, the, the plasma itself, let's say it's into a cluster medium in a cluster of galaxies, is undergoing some bulk motion. So th th these are very interesting effects, um, but they tend to operate on small scales. So I'm going to ignore them in this talk. This is, this is much more about some rather large scale effects. So the third effect, um, and the one that's, that's going to dominate most of what I have to say, is about gravitational lensing of the microwave background. So here's a nice picture showing um, the, 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 the back screen of the, of the CMB and the primary temperature fluctuations propagating their way through the perturbed universe to our, to our eyes at, at redshift zero. And what's yeah, so there's, as I as I mentioned, if the matter if the potential fluctuations are evolving, there's integrated sachs wolf effect. But even without that, um, even static potential fluctuations will perturb the photon trajectories. So that means a picture at last of the, the structure at last scattering is distorted. Um, and it's easy to simulate this. So let's take a small patch of the, of the microwave background. This is. When I say small, it is, this is only a, a square six arc minutes across. So this is actually comparable in size to, um, to the resolution of the beam on the Planck satellite, which is the, 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 the principal source of, of microwave information up till now. Um, so this is a heavily idealized CMB experiment. So that's a realization of, of ideal primordial temperature fluctuations. And now let's put large scale structure at the right sort of level in front of it. So I can swap between these two. And so you can see a number of things. You can see quite strong gravitational lensing as it's called. So here would be a cluster of galaxies and you're getting a, an, an Einstein ring um, caused by that, that discrete object. But more what you see is a kind of subtle you know, focus say on, on this region here you see a, a kind of subtle rearrangement of the pattern on the sky. So this is a really interesting effect um, because what it does, it takes this primordial temperature fluctuation, which is random phase. It has a, a completely Gaussian statistical nature and it imprints non-Gaussian effects on it. And those non-Gaussian effects allow us to make a map of these gravitational lensing effects. That is a map actually of the density fluctuations integrated along the line of sight. So it's an incredibly powerful thing to be able to do. Let me just 
lay out a, a little bit of the terminology. Um, so here is a, a sketch supposed to, to indicate gravitational lensing and operation. Um, you have some source of radiation, the CMB in our case, sends off photons that would miss you as an observer, but some matter concentration deflects that light and the photon reaches your eye. So you think the photon actually came from this apparent position here rather than the true position. The difference between that observed and intrinsic angle on the sky, you can write as just the, um, the angular gradient of, of some scalar potential phi. That scalar potential is the line integral of new, the Newtonian potential, um, which dictates the gravitational accelerations that, that alter the photon trajectories with a weight, geometrical weighting factor that depends on the, the distances, the angular diameter distance, if we're being technical. Um, first of all, from us to the, the lens, then from the lens to, to the source. Um, because the Newtonian potential obeys Poisson's equation, the lensing potential, psi, also obeys a, a, an angular Poisson equation. And the right hand side is a thing that's called a convergence. And this is a, a useful number intuitively. Um, what it amounts to is, is a line integral of the density, again, with some distance de dependent kernel. Um, and if kappa is small, then lensing distortions are weak. Um, when it becomes of order unity, then you get strong distortions like that um, octopus sucker Einstein ring around the the cluster in the simulation I showed you. So Psi and Kappa are two alternative ways of, of quantifying the, the, the lensing pattern on the sky. The question is, can we deduce them given, um, given some data? And with the micro background, yes, you can. And, and this, this is how it works. Um, the temperature that you actually see at some angular position X as I said, is um, actually copying the, the temperature fluctuation from some different location offset by this, this lensing deflection and the gradient of psi. So if you tailor expand that, there's basically a change to the temperature field, which is the product of the, of the gradient of, of the lensing potential times the gradient of the temperature itself. So that is an interesting modification because it means therefore that the temperature field that you see um, is correlated with its own gradient. And that's something that wouldn't be the case for a, for a perfect random phase um, CMB. So our expectation is that the, the, the temperature fluctuations that we start off with um, are accurately Gaussian, in which case there'd be no correlation between temperature and the gradient. Um, so again, if you, if you look at this expression for the, the change in, in the temperature, if you, uh, if you think about taking the, the divergence, or, or rather, so construct the, um, the correlation between temperature and the gradient of the temperature, um, that pulls off something that's, that's proportional to, uh, to, del to the gradient of psi. You take the divergence of that, you can get something that's proportional to del squared psi. So you can, you can construct an estimator um, of either the, the lensing potential or the, the, the convergence by this, this strange nonlinear combination. And this really works. Um, so here's an example from, from this 2006 review by Lewis and Chaloner. Um, here is a, a simulated deflection field. What's actually being grayscaled here is the, uh, the, the magnitude of the deflection angle. So this is the amplitude, the, the, the modulus of, of, of grad psi. Um, if you just have the CMB temperature field modulated by this, this perturbation, this sort of approach would give you this reconstruction. Um, as you can see, it's not perfect. It becomes a good deal more accurate if you add in not only the temperature, but also the, the polarization data. So this, this is basically the algorithm that, that, that Planck implements. Uh, okay, John, so, yeah. John, sorry. 
Uh, we have a question in the chat. If this sure, is okay. go ahead. Yeah, from uh, Ganesh. He asked, what is that run like things in the image just now? So maybe he's referring to the previous slides or Janet, maybe you can go ahead and ask, unmute and ask your, yourself. Uh, uh, before the lensing terminology, can you go back please? Yeah, here there is a round like pattern, right? Okay, so this, this image that you're looking at is is, a, is a, a simulation, a realization of an ideal microwave background temperature perturbation. It's pure Gaussian metric fluctuations perturbing the CMB temperature. But if you ray trace those photons through a, uh, an inhomogeneous mass distribution, they get perturbed in, in locations. And where there's a particularly strong mass concentration, so here there's probably a, a cluster of galaxies of mass, say 10 to 15 solar masses along the line of sight, there you get strong gravitational lensing. So it's, it's these effects that you're, that you're worried about? Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Got it. Okay, so actually that's precisely what's it, uh, it was caricatured here. This, if this is a, your cluster, it's actually possible to have light go either side of, from a single source, can go either side of the cluster. So if you think about that in in 3D, you actually get a, a ring of light, and that's that's precisely what, what you're seeing here. There's just um, a okay. single Thank bright you, spot in the microwave sky, probably here, mm -hmm. and it's, it's turned into this, this this single ring. So if you could see images like this, it's it's very easy to, to see where the lensing effects are present, but you have to remember this is all smeared out with a Planck beam, which makes it harder. As I explained. Um, Statistically, this non-Gaussian signature, the fact that temperature and the gradient of temperature are correlated, means you just multiply those, those two fields and with a, an appropriate smoothing, you can extract some estimate of the strength of the lensing signal as a function of position. And this is what it actually looks like. So um, Planck had two goes at this. So this is their first CMB lensing map in 2013, which is based only on the temperature data and here in 2015, they added in the, um, the polarization. So let me just flick between these. So you can, get an S, you can get a feeling for what the signal to noise in this is, which is only moderate. I mean, what I've done here is I've, I've filtered the, um, the map with, uh, for, with half maximum of, a, of, of order a degree, because on smaller scales, um, this, this this recovered lensing map is just extremely noisy. So we only learn about large scale mass fluctuations, but you, know, you can see that, for example, um, look at this little hot spot here, it's, it's present. So we can be confident that the matter density was roughly 5% higher than average along that line of sight, right back to Richard 1100 which I think is an amazing thing to, to have, this, this map of all the large-scale structure that ever existed. Right, but there's a problem, which is, wouldn't you like to know at what redshift those accumulated superclusters existed? <coughs> oh, by the way, so just let me point out that if you take, if you measure the power spectrum of that map, um, of course, the Lambda CDM theory for structure formation makes a prediction for what we should see because we predict how large-scale structure develops along the last line of sight and that's this line here um, the gray bars show the the, um, the the power spectrum of that lensing map and it matches the lambda cdm prediction using the parameters you get from the temperature field from Planck um, very accurately so that's extremely pleasing um, and actually if you want to make more exotic cosmological models Bring in this this CMB lensing data helps you uh, break you know, rule out a lot of the, the exotic alternatives and really focuses the uh, on the simple lambda CDM as the preferred alternative. All right, so as as I said, what you'd really like to be able to do is do this as a function of distance because we know this enhanced um, matter densities along the line of sight. But we'd learn more about the, um, the cosmological model if, if we could get some three-dimensional information. 
And the way I'm going to do this is, is, to, be able, is to say, okay, if I have a, a large galaxy catalog, which I can get some rich information out of, then I can cross correlate the CMB signal in a tomographic way. That is, I can cross correlate the lensing, CMB lensing map with large scale structure and the galaxy distribution as a function of redshift. And then I can pull out the part of that signal that comes from the, from the particular redshift. So I'm gonna show you some results from a study we just published, and this was led by my PhD student. Um, before she arrived, I carefully learned to pronounce her name, Chan Jun, um, only to be informed that she preferred to be called Ellen. Anyway, um, there she is. So <clears throat> let me show you what, what, what we did in this study. And what we were doing was exploiting um, a great new resource for observational cosmology, which comes from a project called DESI. Um, pretty soon, a lot of people around the planet will, will be giving very interesting results. Uh -oh. Okay, so the <laughs> we have 10 minutes. So yeah, just if if this no. um, meeting is over, just yeah, just click the, the same link. Okay. Right. Um, so this is a, the model of all redshift surveys. It's going to give us something about 10 times the, the current state of the art. We'll get a sample of about 30 million redshifts by taking over the, the Kip Peak 4 meter telescope for a five year project that's actually underway right now. Um, in order to do a redshift survey though, you, you need imaging because a, a multi-fiber experiment like, um, like DESI needs to be able to position fiber optics on known positions of galaxies. So one of the amazing tools that DESI has bequeathed to cosmology is the, um, what's called the legacy survey. And this consisted of, of taking imaging in, in three wave bands, GR and Z, to pretty impressive depths actually, you know, like a couple of magnitudes be below um, at the Sloan Digital Sky Survey over, well, more than half the extra galactic sky, 17,000 square degrees. And what's even more impressive is that all this information has been made homogeneous, cross calibrated, so that the magnitudes have the same meaning over the whole sky, and it's been made freely available. So there's this wonderful uh, website, legacysurvey.org, where you can pull up images of the sky um, and download catalogs for free. These catalogs have also been made much more powerful because the frequency coverage has been extended by, by um, pairing up with WISE. So WISE, again, is an astonishing tool for cosmology. It gives us all sky information, um, imaging at three, four and, and, and longer wavelengths. So three microns is really the, the, the deepest and most important wave band. So um, this was launched, I guess, in 2009. Um, took data for several years, paused, but was then actually brought back to life to, um, for a variety of new projects, one of which was to provide deeper information precisely for, for DESI targeting. So what we've got is, is uh, the GRZ and um, W1, three micron information for these galaxies. And what you're able to do with, with that broadband information is, is estimate photometric redshifts. So photo, photo Zs is, is, a, is a huge industry in cosmology. It's um, less precise than spectroscopy because you're limited by the, the width of the, of the imaging bands, but you get much better signal to noise with imaging than you do spectroscopy. So this is the sort of thing that you can do. This is, this is what we produced from, from, from this, this public release. Um, there's a lot of techniques that varying degrees of sophistication that are, that are used in, um, in producing photometric redshifts. Uh, there's a lot of public packages that you can download and use. What I wanted to do in, in this case was do something that was rather simpler, basically, so that we had a lot of the details of the method completely under our control. And we took, oh, I have a couple of dogs, as you can probably hear in the background. 
<laughs> it's okay. <laughs> um, uh, I'm sorry you can't see them there. I'm not cuter than I am. So what we did was, was take a, the most direct approach possible, which was just to make a cube in color space. So G minus R, R minus Z, Z minus W1. Um, split it up into pretty fine pixels, and then ask, looking at all the, the sources of redshifts that we, that we have, um, from STSS to uh, the smaller, deeper um, things, for example, the, um, the Z Cosmos project, um, uh, Vipers, uh, anyway, there's, there's a long list of, of, of deep thinking and eight surveys. Asking, put those objects in the same color space and ask if you can derive a spectroscopic redshift for objects of that color. Um, and what we found was that 78% of, of the, um, the pixels in this 3D space where, where we had objects in, in, the, in the actual DESI survey, we could, uh, we could calibrate. So you basically make some cuts, you throw away galaxies in extreme regions of color space that are not well calibrated. And for the rest, you, you assign the average redshift to the spectroscopic data. And it works beautifully. Um, there's a photometric estimate against spectroscopic redshift. And you can go out to, to redshift one with this data set and the fractional error in, in, in red, well, the way it's normally expressed, um, the RMS error in, in the redshift divided by one plus Z is one to 1.5%. 1 so you know, for photometric redshifts, this is, this is not bad quality at all. And this is a, a logarithmic scale. So you see there are some, some outliers, but you know, at a tiny fraction of the, of the overall sample. So what you can do, or what we is divide this up into a number of bins where the bins are wide enough that given the photo Z error, uh, things are basically pretty well independent. And here were our choices. Um, we chose to stop at Rich of 0.8, and we've got four bins in between. So the thing that's of, of great interest is to know what the true rich of distribution for each of these slices is. Um, I'll say a little bit more later on about, about how that's estimated. So for a moment, let's just accept that, that these, these colored line, solid colored lines here with very small confidence bands reflect the, the true rich of distribution that's imposed by that, um, by that um, photo selection. So you can see there's a little bit of overlap of the bands, of course, in the tails of the distribution, um, but generally they're pretty clean. Um, here are the sky maps that you get with the, the galaxy density in, in, those, in those slices going from the most nearby local slice to the highest redshift. And if I didn't tell you which was which, you'd be able to see. Um, because it's clear that the angular scale of large scale structure here is finer than it is in the lowest redshift slice. So, of course, we've taken things further away. So. The aim of tomography then is, is to say, let's take these slices, cross-correlate them with the, um, with the CMB lensing map that comes from Planck, and that should pull out um, the, uh, the, the cosmological structure that exists at those redshifts. It tells us something about how, uh, how, how it tests the, the lambda CDM prediction for how rapidly um, matter inhomogeneities have built up. Uh, John, I have a question. Yep. Uh, wh why you use uh, four tomographic beans? Because, for example, in, in other projects, in LSST, we use five. So it's just uh, a choice. It, 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 it's, a, it's arbitrary. Um, you obviously can't use that many more here, because otherwise the, the individ individual bins will start to become quite heavily correlated. Um, but obviously, uh, you want to you want to have some information on how things evolve with redshift. So four seemed a, seemed a fairly sweet spot here. That there's a, a moderate crossover between the between adjacent bins, but bins that are two apart are, are completely independent. Um, didn't actually test out 
Well, actually, I will show you results where, in fact, one combines the whole data set with, without it. Um, in fact, you get equivalent results whether you take the individual bins, where you then have to include statistically uh, how that, was, that information is correlated, or the um, or the overall thing, which where we don't try to discriminate exactly what's happening between redshift point eight and zero. I guess we get the dark energy camera on, on the, um, the Blanco four meter. Um, so as you can see, that, that goes up to um, that 30 degrees declination. And LSST, being in Chile, is going to cover much the same area of the sky. It'll, it'll go a bit closer to the galactic plane. Um, But uh, because the, um, and it will go right to the, the southern celestial pole because the, um, the Kip Peak 4 meter obviously can't see right, right to declination minus 90. But as you can see, this actually goes, um, the, legacy, the, the imaging survey goes further south because it, it incorporates a dark energy survey. So even though um, DESI itself won't, won't observe further south than, than this cut here, and um, you can see quite a bit of the southern sky is covered. So roughly all of this will be LSST, but a good fraction of that is, is the, the galaxy, which um, you know, for extralactic projects won't be of, of so much interest. Okay, good. So let me show you the results of these cross correlations. I'll start off just briefly with the, the ISW effect. Um, the ISW effect is a, turns out, is a rather low signal-to-noise phenomenon. So here, what, what I'm showing you, by the way, are, I'll probably keep saying cross-correlations, but these are, these are done in the harmonic space. So they're actually cross-powers. So you, you, you take those sky maps, you construct a spherical harmonic transform. Um, so you take two different maps, so you have spherical harmonic transform coefficients and you just multiply them uh, in the same way as you would mul multiply the or square the coefficient for a, for, for a single um, map to make, to make an angular power spectrum. The results are the blue points. These are the cross powers with, with all the different topographic bins and the black line, which barely departs from zero, um, just with a, and a, it's only at very low harmonic numbers below about 50, so rather large scales, tens of degrees, that there's predicted to be any signal at all. In any one of those bins, you would rightly say, I see no strong evidence that signal is present. If you combine them all, however, into this, this last one, the green bin, and look at the relatively small error bars just here, in fact, there is a detection. So the, <clears throat> if, if you ask, take the black line, scale it by some arbitrary amplitude, A, what's the preferred value of A? The answer is one, um, as opposed to zero if there was, there was no signal. But it's only a three sigma deviation from, from zero. So things are consistent with lambda CDM, but it's hardly a high precision test. However, it's much, much more interesting in all sorts of ways when we talk about the, uh, the, the lensing. So now what I'm doing is showing you the cross power between these, these galaxy fields and the, um, <coughs> excuse me, and the, um, the temperature, uh, sorry, and, and the CMB lensing map. So, now you can see a much higher signal to noise in the measurements. Um, and the black line is, is, is the, the, the Planck um, estimate. Now, if you haven't done this sort of thing before, but you, you know a little bit about cosmology, you might wonder how it's possible to make a prediction here. Because when we look at, uh, when we look at these pictures, we're looking at the, f the fluctuating number density of galaxies. Okay, it's color coded um, to a, a fraction of perturbation. So minus 0.5 means a, a, 
an abundance of galaxies that's half the, um, the average. 0.5 means it's 1.5 times the average. But we've known for, for many decades that, that galaxies are biased tracers. That is, what, um, even though where there's more galaxies, there's more dark matter, that doesn't necessarily go in direct proportion. So there's some unknown bias parameter that connects these maps to what we'd really like to have, which is fluctuations in the matter density. Um, so how do we determine that bias parameter? Well, we've got available, of course, not only the cross correlation between the maps and the, the CMB, but the, um, the autocorrelations of the maps themselves. So the cross correlation brings in one power of the bias parameter. The, the autocorrelation involves two powers of the bias parameter. So by using both those bits of information, you can infer the bias parameter and make a prediction. When you do that, um, what your eye should show you um, without any fancy statistics is that the blue points are always low compared to, to the model. And it's particularly clear when you combine the, the different bins to an analysis that, that just includes the overall redshift range. Um, you can see right the way through, okay, by the time you get to multiple numbers of 500 or so, things are becoming noisy, but certainly up right the way to, to LF300, the signal is low compared to the prediction. And it's low by about 10%. Um, so if you scale the black line by some unknown number A, it has to be about down by, by, by about 10%. Um, and that's with a, you know, now, now, now this is, this is, this is, this is detected with good significance. So there's some inconsistency between the amplitude of, of, of CMB lensing, at least at low redshift, where we're able to probe it, and what Planck would predict taking its fiducial parameters, which I remind you are a matter density parameter of, of just over 0.3, and the normalization of the, the, the mass fluctuations, which is this number sigma eight, which is the, the RMS, if you take the, the, the matter field, smooth it with a sphere of radius eight megaparsecs and look at the, the, the RMS fluctuations in that. Um, that that's that, that's um, the number of 0.8. Um, so you might be skeptical about whether well, you should believe this. Um, if you're familiar with this field, you'll know that one of the, you know, the big concerns with, 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 with lens modeling is, is whether your photometric redshifts are, are correct and correctly uh, modified, uh, correctly calibrated. So one of the ways we tried to verify this was to look not only at the, um, at the autocorrelations. So here is the different redshift bins looking at the, the auto power. As, as I remind you, this is where we infer the, the bias parameter for the fiducial Planck cosmology. And you can see the signal to noise in the auto power is, is amazingly good. So the bias is, is determined effectively perfectly. But you also look at the cross correlation, except here it's expressed as a correlation coefficient um, between all the different bins. So you can see that bin zero, the lowest rich shift, has some non zero correlation with the um, with bin one, as you would expect, depending on the tails of the redshift distribution. The other bins, there's no correlation. So these correlations between the adjacent bins allow us to calibrate whether we're understanding the redshift errors. Um, and the answer is yes, we do. We get, we get, we get a very good reproduction of these, these cross correlations. You can also say, Let's do this with a completely different set of photometric redshifts. Um, this paper, Cho et al, um, in 2020, used the machine learning approach to use much the same data as, as, as we did with a, you know, a, a new artificial neural nets. So the nastiest of black boxes, they produce a result. You don't really know quite how they got it, but you can just compare our redshifts with, with theirs. Um, and so here is the redshift difference um, as a function of the actual redshift. 
and we do this in Northern Hemisphere and the Southern Hemisphere because it's different telescopes. You can see there are slight systematic trends. You can put those trends in or take them out. It, it makes no difference to, to the answers. So we believe that this discrepancy is real. So let's talk about the interpretation. Um, so here is a, a, the equation that you use. It's this thing here is the, is the cross power between the galaxies and kappa, the, remember the, uh, the convergence, this, this dimensionless amplitude, the strength of gravitational lensing. It's a line integral over redshift. Um, it involves the, this thing delta squared is the, is the matter power spectrum, which comes from the fiducial Planck model. And it has one power of the bias, as I explained. And we get the bias, as I explained, from the galaxy autocorrelation. So <clears throat> basically, how does this cross power vary with the cosmological parameters? Well, what we measure, apart from this, um, this, this amplitude of this, this, the bias parameter, is something that's to do with the fractional fluctuations in, in, in the matter. Whereas lensing, of course, sorry, that's in the galaxy fluctuations, but in lensing, you are sensitive to the matter, the overall mass fluctuations, the total mass fluctuations. So there is a proportionality to the matter density, the density parameter. Um, you would also expect that the amplitude of this fluctuation, of this cross power, would increase if the matter fluctuations were, were increased in amplitude. So naively, your analytic expectation is that this signal should scale linearly with the density parameter, linearly with the, um, the normalization, sigma eight. Trouble is, as I emphasized, there's this geometrical part inside the kernel, which involves the, the different distances in cosmology they also depend on, on the density parameter. So in fact, when you look at the detail dependence, it's non-linear and it's not linear in the, the density, it's more like the, the 0.8 power. So actually, um, since what we're measuring is effectively the value of this combination relative to the fiducial Planck model, we can get an estimate of omega matter to the 0.78 times sigma eight and here is the, our number. So that's a direct cosmological constraint um, that, that comes out of this low lensing amplitude relative to, to Planck. Now, we've seen this before, and very much the same sort of reasoning goes on in the surveys that study gravitational lensing from galaxy shapes. So there's um, a couple of projects that have been trying for a number of years to do this. Um, the Kilo Degree Survey, which uses ESO's um, <clears throat> VST. Um, the Dark Energy Survey, which, um, which also uses the, um, the, the, the Blanco Telescope in Chile. Um, they push to, to slightly higher redshifts and rather fainter galaxies. So they, their photometric redshifts are a bit, um, bit noisier than ours, but they go through the same exercise. Here's the photo Z selection, um, a bin 0.2 wide. Here's the true rich of distribution, the best estimate that the kids have um, corresponding to that. They measure a whole pile of statistics. I'm not even going to explain precisely how they quantify um, the correlations between galaxy shapes, but again, it can be done correlating the signal that, that's seen in any photometric in, uh, tomographic bin to any other. And here they have five bins rather than four, but then there's a larger redshift range. So the actual delta Z is, is, is very similar, about 0.2. Um, they have a model, the red line that matches the data very well. What is that model? Well, again, it's discrepant with Planck. Um, so weak galaxy shear for a number of years, as these analyses have built up, has consistently produced this banana, as it's called, on the, the omega matter sigma eight plane. Um, 
they tend to squash things down to a parameter called S8, which is proportional to sigma 8 times the square root of omega matter. So it's interesting, it's a different, this is important, it's a different and weaker dependence on, on, on the density um, than, than we found. And that's because, that's, that's because of the geometrical factors. We're looking at a, a source at large distances. Um, that's, um, let's say, the microwave background at redshift 1100. They're looking at galaxies at redshifts only up to one being lensed by galaxies at redshift a half, typically. So they, that, that absorbs some of the sensitivity to omega matter. But you can see this, both um, kids and des prefer this banana that goes below the fiducial Planck number. Most of the discussion you'll read in, in the, the, the weak galaxy literature actually tends to assume implicitly that the explanation for this is downwards, that it's, it's something to do with the normalization of fluctuations. But I don't think that's the case, because I told you um, early on that actually the CMB lensing signal that Planck measures fits their fiducial prediction very nicely. And if you go to the Planck papers, you'll find this combination, sigma eight times omega matter to the 0.25, see again, a different sensitivity to the matter density. And that's because now you're looking at the, the total CMB lensing signal, which comes largely from, from structure at redshift two, so again, the, the, the effects, the geometrical effects of the distance terms uh, are different. Um, anyway, you, you have that combination. So if you think about the constraints on the sigma eight omega matter plane, we have a lovely situation. We have a number of degenerate bands, but they all occupy different loci. So here is the, 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 the result from, from Ellen's paper with the, uh, the strongest density dependence. Um, here is the, the, the total CMB lensing band, which you see is nicely consistent overlapping Planck. Our band is inconsistent. The intermediate one, the weak galaxy shear band is also inconsistent. But all these three lensing results are consistent with each other with an overlap zone of about here. Um, and you can see, and that's the, that's the blue ellipsoid. And basically, in terms of normalization of fluctuations, it's well consistent with Planck, around sigma eight of about 0.8, but it prefers a lower density. So the fiducial Planck density parameter is 0.315. Putting these lensing results together, and actually this is more or less what you would get even without the galaxy shear, just from total and topographic CMB lensing, we prefer about 0.27. If you didn't like conflict, you would look for a compromise and you'd put it here, of course. And it's interesting to note that, that here is a tension, undoubtedly. It's not that strong. That is, if you favor a matter density of about 0.29 something, you can just about creep within the 95% confidence limits of both experiments. So it doesn't say that Planck did anything wrong or that Lensing did anything wrong, but just that Planck's errors happen to fluctuate to a higher density than, than the true figure. Well, but this is not the only tension that exists in cosmology. There's a lot of discussion, as you've, you've heard, doubtless about the value of the Hubble constant, where Planck's value is about 67, Whereas Adam Rees and people trying to measure things directly using the Cepheid distance scale have a number of 73. There's no easy room for compromise between these. But this make, makes some sense because if you look at how Planck constrains these parameters, there's a very strong degeneracy between its preferred density and it's preferred Hubble constant, and that's this little blue locus here. Um, so if you want to go to a lower Hubble uh, density parameter, as I think the lensing results 
say you want to be pushed to the left hand side of this, your preferred Hubble constant goes up. Um, and that's really, as a rule of thumb, you can say that the microwave background, just the principal location of the, the, um, the angular structure of the, of, the, of the main acoustic peaks, pins down omega matter times h cubed perfectly with, z with zero error. So if you want to, to say, I need to lower the density parameter relative to the, the central Planck value, you must raise the Hubble constant. If you go to the compromised value, your preferred Hubble constant would be 69. If you go to the central value preferred by lensing, your Hubble constant would be 71. Certainly 71 is completely consistent with, with the, the, the Cepheid values. 69 would still be discrepant, but the amount, the, the size of the systematic that would be needed in the, in the direct distance scale wouldn't be nearly as large as if you're trying to get down to the headline 67 from Planck. So my take on this is that, that you know, there are two tensions, but if you combine them all, it focuses you in a region of parameter space where it looks like um, it may be that future experiments with a better understanding of systematics will become consistent. So that's, that's my message. Um, well, first of all, let me advertise once again, what an amazing resource this, this DESI legacy survey is. Um, and just to reiterate this, this conclusion that we've had the CMB, we've, for a long time, we've had this lensing amplitude tension. We've also got the, um, the, the Hubble constant tension, but it looks to me like they are actually two manifestations of the same tension. And therefore my, my suspicion is that um, as the field evolves, we're not going to be led to new physics. We're actually just going to find that things come together in, in, the, in the compromise position. So thank you. That's taken a bit longer than, than I intended, but um, we did take a little while to start and then we had the interruption. Um, I hope you're all still there. And if any questions, <laughs> I'm happy to take them. Okay, thank you, John. Very nice talk. Um, so yeah, we have time for questions now. So please go ahead. Uh, I can ask a question. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot for the nice talk. So uh, actually, I have two questions. One is about the very last thing to, that you you said. That uh, if I understood correctly, you said that sigma eight and h not tension, according to, to your opinion, are uh, two 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 sides of the same uh, problem. Uh, is that right? That, 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 yes, that, yes, I, I think so. Um, focus on this point that if you if you had to say take one number that, that we know very accurately from the microwave background, it's mm -hmm. the product of the density parameter times the cube of the Hubble constant. So if you worry that the Planck result is is not perfect, either just because they're, they're unlucky with with the random errors, right. or Perhaps if there's a small systematic, and after all, by definition, it, it's it's impossible with any experiment to, to say there's no systematic at the at the one sigma level. So you could easily imagine that Planck's number could be displaced from the truth by two of their sigma at least. If it's displaced in the sense of, of their density being too high, their Hubble constant must be too low. Right. Okay. So, the, the, if you see a tension in one of these things, you would predict a tension in the other. And we do see two tensions in the right. sense that you would predict. But, but, but even, this, even if these things were not uh, due to the same reason, if they are real and not just, uh, you know, uh, statistical things, shouldn't they we have a common solution if the two tensions are, are are there are real things shouldn't be resolved by by just you know one adjustment I, i'm not sure if i'm being clear but uh, yeah no well okay okay um let, let's suppose that the that, that the universe has parameters that are precisely the, the Planck central values 
relatively high Hubble constant, a uh, relatively high density, relatively low Hubble constant. Well, then you need two distinct pieces of new physics to reconcile the lensing results and the and the Cepheid results. Yeah. Yes. Uh, for the lensing results, for example, you might become very excited and say, this is the uh, first indications of modified gravity. Apparently, density fluctuations haven't grown at precisely the, uh, the, um, the rate predicted in the standard model. And so there's a, um, there's a reduced, uh, you know, the strength of gravity at on cosmological scales is reduced. Or, uh, or for example, the, um, the, as we know, the strength of gravitational lensing depends on both the time-time and the space-space parts of the metric. Uh, normally those those have equal strengths the famous factor of two in, in lensing light deflection but maybe we're learning that actually the uh, the ratio between those is, is not one to one you would, you would be led in that direction to to, to investigate the, um, the, uh, the the lensing discrepancy but the, the Hubble parameter discrepancy you you would have to do something that altered the um, the physics of, of of high redshift, um, you know, let, 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 if you assume that, uh, that Adam Rees H of 73 is really the correct local expansion rate, then the CMB, the, the acoustic scale itself, uh, our accurate measuring rod that allows us to, to infer the Hubble constant would have to be changed. And people talk about exotic physics, for example, a little, little bit of early dark energy some scalar fields that's um, decaying away at, 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 at redshift 1100 as a, as a possible solution. But to me, it's much more economical. Well, look, first of all, from a Bayesian point of view, you should also always be skeptical about, about new physics. It's, it's always easy to say, oh, these measurements don't agree. There must be some new physics. New physics does happen. Um, cosmology in the, the 1990s accepted the existence of a cosmological constant, whereas in the 1980s, most people would have assumed without question that lambda was zero. So that revolution happened, but such revolutions are, are pretty rare, whereas systematic errors in measurements happen all the time. So my prejudice is it's much more likely that these two tensions just indicate that the, the, the errors in all the, the relevant experiments aren't perfectly understood. And uh... I understand what you say. It's pretty clear what, what you meant. Uh, is there no independent uh, probe of uh, omega matter uh, from, from somewhere or uh, not at all? Yes, 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 indeed. Um, the so does that... Uh, okay, we've uh, got 10 minutes left to, to sort this out. Um, <clears throat> I mean, one thing that's interesting, actually, maybe it's on this, this plot, yeah. So you can put contours on, on, the, on the H naught omega matter plane in a way that's independent of, of the microwave background um, using barren acoustic oscillations. So right. those are the same acoustic oscillations that, that give us the principal one degree structure in the microwave background, but we see them in, in, in the angular power spectrum of, of, of galaxy clustering. So we can trace out the distance redshift relation, which depends on the Hubble parameter and on the, on, and on the density parameter. It also depends on, on the baryonic density, but if you, um, if you constrain that using nuclear synthesis, um, then, then you have a, like, within the assumptions of, of the standard model, you, you have constraints on all the parameters. Um, it's not quite that. That's the um, yeah. That's that's the green thing. Oh, oh, and it's 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 actually using distance information from barren oscillations and the supernova Hubble diagram. It's it's, it's really quite comparable information. Um, and that gives you the the green thing, which isn't quite as accurate as you would like, perhaps, but does prefer this left hand side of the of the blue Planck locus, which is the same the same side of things that the lensing results prefer. So I think there's abundant evidence that whatever the truth, it, 
it's to the left hand side of the central Planck value. Right? And obviously, you know, Planck's omega matter of 0.315 has to be either higher or lower than the truth. I think you know, we know enough to say that the truth is, is, is lower than 0.315. The only question is by how much. Okay, so thank you. Very interesting discussion. <laughs> Do we have more questions? I want to ask something else, but but I will wait if someone else. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. I have one question. Hi, um, it's me, Domenico. Um, regarding this plot, actually, so at the end of the day, in cosmology, what we do, we 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 measure distances, right? And uh, from them, then we want to infer some cosmological parameters. This is what we do, for instance, for the CMB. I guess that. Uh, giving the, the, so we want to measure primarily, you know, the side, but the angle under which we can see, we see the BAO uh, scale, and from there measure the distance to the scattering, uh, and then infer some parameters. And here's the same, and now I was looking at the, at the, at the gray uh, area, the, the reset all, 2018. So what I can see is that, so what I was saying, okay, if you measure distance, distance is Hubble parameter, so of course, it depends both on H, not an omega M. So, but here it's observable, I mean, for this at all, basically the, the, the observation that they have is completely insensitive to omega matter. So, regardless of the value we add, H zero is that value. And, uh, um, so, and now I'm confused actually, Probably have to read the paper. So, if you can explain to me, so uh, why so? I would, I would have guessed that uh, they both. I mean, recent all will measure also omega matter in a better way. I don't know if I'm also yeah. Clear. Well, well I, I mean, this. I guess this plot is slightly misleading because, mm -hmm. um, as as you rightly say, the. Um, well, uh, well, actually, no. Well, in one in one way, I disagree. You said we measure distances. Mm. Of course, we, we 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 don't. We measure angles or, or fluxes, and we try try to yes. infer distances yes. from, yes. from that. Yes. Um, so, so Reese Reese is analysing the apparent weakness of Cepheids. Um, their inference on, on H naught will depend must have some dependence on on the um, on, on the density parameter, um, so uh, you know what they were done would, 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 have, would, would have been to say, well, we'll, we'll adopt a central value around point around, around point three, right? So everybody knows that omega matter isn't point four. So when when so the plot, this whoever made this plot was really just taking that central value, which which assumed omega matter at the, at the near the fiducial, and uh, and just filling up the whole space, which is a bit naughty. These ends really shouldn't have been shown. You could compute it, and and there will be some small trend with with, with omega matter. But 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 just let, let me emphasise. I didn't say this explicitly. I can't see how the true value of, of the Hubble parameter can be as high as seventy two or seventy three. I, I think there's there's a good indication from combining these different lensing results with, with Planck, that you should push it to the highest value that, 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 that Planck permits, which I think 69 would be absolutely fine. Maybe if you were really going to, to go to the extreme, possibly 70 is not ruled out. But getting above 70, I, I, I think you know, then you have to break something rather than just appealing to, to um, Bad luck with the statistics. So either Reese eventually has to find little refinements to his analysis that move things down to 70, or we will need new physics. But I think for me, thinking about how difficult the direct distance ladder is, getting from 73 to, to 70 or 69, you know, 
yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised if that's how it worked out. Mm. So the truth should lie somewhere in between uh, in the end. Well, you know, a number of years ago, I, I, I gave a talk where I had to pick the value of the Hubble constant. And even then, you know, you know, there, were, there was the high H and the low H. So I said, I'm going to pick 65 as a compromise. And Mike Turner stood up afterwards and said, oh, John Peake is obviously a middle child trying to reduce conflict between warring siblings. And I had to tell him that I didn't have any brothers or sisters, actually. But nevertheless, I think trying to find compromise, it's, it, it's a smart move. I mean, Planck has been worked over so hard. They've done such a beautiful job, so many thorough cross checks. The same is true. I mean, I'm not going to speak for my, my own work or Alan's, Alan's work, but the, the people who've worked on, on gravitational lensing with direct galaxy shear, again, they've, they've been at this for, for a decade. They've repeated analyses many times, different assumptions, new techniques. It's always come out there or thereabouts on the purple band. So I, th I think you have to, to try to accept both of these and not just say, oh, well, one of them has a systematic. It's, it's always so easy to say. Sorry, John. But Sorry, the Frank. message is very clear. The compromise has to be where this X is. And it's a density parameter of about 0.29, a Hubble constant of about 69. John, sorry, we have less than a minute. So if, if there are more questions, we can over again enter to the same link for, <laughs> for yeah, you, for last questions. You and, if you okay. guys have the stamina, I'm happy to keep going. Okay, yeah, of course. So, okay, but keep going. Uh, just we re enter to the same link, okay? Okay. Okay, thanks for my side. So, well, we have a question in the chat for from you, Julian. Julian, maybe you can unmute and ask yourself. Oh, thank you. Um, yes, uh, that was uh, very interesting. And uh, uh, I noticed a slight uh, variation in the presentation about the uh, the tension with uh, reset al at one point you know, getting to 71 seemed to be okay but then um you know 70 was okay but uh, fundamentally it's the distance ladder which um casts doubt on things how long do you think it will be before ligo and other gravitational wave observa observatories are able to use standard size to resolve some of the distance ladder doubts well um LIGO has given us um, a break time to, to pull up this, this image, which probably, probably you've seen, which is their, their standard siren estimate. Um, so there are two curves on here. This one, which is hardly discriminatory at all, although it kind of disfavors things below about, about 30 or 40. Um, that comes from black hole binaries. So there you've got direct, there's no optical transient. So all you have is you've got directionality on the sky and therefore you have quite a, a number of, of candidate host galaxies, um, each of which has a known redshift, but you don't know which is the right one. So you, you have to average over them with a weighting given by the, by the localization. Um, and there's one object, which was the, the, um, the 2017 neutron star merger, where there was an optical transient, and therefore we have a redshift. Um, that gives this curve here, which of course completely dominates your, your knowledge. So you, 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 can, you can read it off from this. I mean, the, the rough one sigma is maybe, three times, certainly twice the discrepancy between Planck and, and, and Adam Rees. So you would want the, you would want the, the fractional error here to be 
probably a factor 10 better before, before you, you could actually reach a discrimination. Okay, so everything goes as root n. So I need 100 neutron star mergers like the 2017 one. But clearly, as far as I'm aware, that's still the only neutron star, neutron star event with, with an optical transient that they're claiming. So in, in, um, in a given observing session, they clearly only get one or, um, or zero. So that, that tells me there's decade, at the current sensitivity of the experiment, the current rate of, of, of events, it'll take decades before there's enough statistics. Um, because you know, the, the, the array, the technology is upgraded regularly. Um, there'll be the Indian experiment in due course. So I think that the, the hope is that, that you know, there'll be an order of magnitude improvement in the number of events um, and if the same fraction of those have optical transients, then maybe in 10 years or less, you, you might be able to do it. But it's, that, that's the problem. You need a lot, you need a lot of events with, with optical transients and there just aren't very many. Yes, in more statistics and the better localization. Thank you. Thank you. So we have time for maybe one more question. Um, I have a question, indeed. Oh, oh okay, go ahead. No worry. Uh, hi, hi, John. Great talk. So my question concerns the the other like blank lensing related anomaly, this so called like a lens kind of tension, the lensing which appears to be too a little bit too strong in that case. Could you comment on that and how this relates to the low redshift lensing being lower than expected? Yes, yes, indeed. Um, so, so I mean, for, for those, well, maybe we don't have time to to explain for those who haven't met it um, what 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 a lens is. But let me, let me just say that it's that's a measure of the total strength of CMB lensing. Okay, so um, it it sends a stronger message that than the, um, the one that you get from the, the reconstructed lensing map, where its power spectrum comes out with an amplitude that's consistent with the fiducial Planck model. Um, the A lens number says, you know, and actually, if anything, the, 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 the total strength of CMB lensing is, is higher than, than fiducial. So certainly, it's not, um, it, it's not lower. So if I um, just briefly share again, where's that button gone? Uh, no. Um, oh, actually no, I bet you're not, you're not seeing the PowerPoint, are you? Uh, no, um, no, we see a picture of. Yeah, sorry. Um, help. There it is. Um, why it doesn't just share the entire screen? So, so you know, here's our here's our headline diagram, right? and I said that this band here was from the total amplitude of, of CMB lensing from the reconstructed map. Now, A lens says that the total amplitude of CMB lensing is high, so that would favor a locus that, that goes up here. So then the, you know, it would push the, the blue ellipse, it would push the, um, the coalescence point up to somewhere around here, perhaps. So taking the A lens signal, assuming you're not going to say, look, it's completely inconsistent with, with Planck, it pushes you to still lower densities okay so you um george stathew claims that with his likelihood pipeline a lens is close is more nearly consistent with one than with the the official blank pipeline which is the french one so there's a lot of politics in in that number
Okay, thank you. Um, but, st but still, still, it's the same okay. message. The, 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 the high redshift, the redshift 2 component of the CMB lensing is definitely not low by 10% in, in the same way as, as the low redshift numbers are. Okay, thank you. Yeah, indeed, I, um, last week there was a paper by George Staffu. I don't know if you, if you yeah. saw the archive, yeah, that he like um, redo the analysis of supernovae and he obtains, I, I think, a value of 71. I, I can't remember well, but he redo the analysis and criticize in a way the calibration method of, of shoes. So yeah, no, it's 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 a long and complicated analysis that they have to do. Yeah. But then so is Planck. I mean, Planck, nobody, no one individual understands how every aspect of, of Planck operates. <laughs> so whether you're in Planck or like me outside it, you, know, you have to look for for consistency arguments to, to see in the end how much you're going to believe any of these things. I think it's amazing that all this agrees so well, right? Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I, I, I think we shouldn't complain when we say we're arguing about is omega matter 0.27 or is it 0.31? You know, we're, <laughs> unless, I mean, everybody hopes that that difference is the route to new physics, but you know, it may well not be. You know, just homing in on the, on the truth. Uh, I have a question. So. If we improve these photometric redshift estimations, do you expect your results change in a way, or this is, will still be consistent, yeah, the analysis that you did with the cross-correlation? Well, as, uh, as, as I said, everybody, everybody in lensing, be it the analysis of weak galaxy shear or this, this, this CMB lensing tomography, you know, they're well aware that the results are only as good as the photometric redshift. It's, it's getting the photosets right as the singus, single biggest potential systematic. Um, so what, what, what can I say? I think, you know, in both lensing to, um, CMB tomography and in weak galaxy shear directly, people keep trying different methods to do the calibration um, and it keeps coming up with this the same tension. So I guess okay. eventually you, 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 your preliminary, your provisional hypothesis is that you're actually doing it right, that there is no, no significant systematic. But as I said, you, you know, when, when you do an experiment and you quote a number plus or minus one sigma, how can you rule out that your, your result is, has a systematic of one sigma? Because by definition, that's buried in the noise. You can't detect it. Yeah. So that means you know, we have to be very careful when you have a you know have two experiments that disagree by even four sigma. You know they could each have a one sigma systematic, and then the difference is two sigma, and that two sigma happens all the time. Yeah. Of course. Sorry, but this is a very this is a very boring um, <laughs> approach to it. It's not nearly as exciting as new physics, I know. <laughs> okay, so if there is one more question. Okay, if not, I would like to thank you, John. Thank you very much. I'm sorry for the interruptions, <laughs> but thank you for a very nice talk, um, very nice discussion, very interesting. So, well, hope to see you in person in a feature for for a for a meeting, or you can come to Chile and taste some some fine wines, yeah. <laughs> Chilean wines. <laughs> in, indeed, and, and, and I hope I'll meet some of you in, in. Well, some I have already. I recognised Andras, but um, for those who haven't, uh, I hope I'll see you in Edinburgh one day. Um, yeah, I just want to say thanks for the for the chance to to present this. It's it's it's, it's nice to to be able to 